Welcome to Invest in Women, the podcast series, your insight into the growing wealth of women and the issues that impact their business and yours. See what happens when you educate, empower, and invest in women. Let's face it, retirement planning can be confusing. At Jackson, we're working to make retirement clear for everyone, starting with you. Our easy-to-understand resources and user-friendly digital tools help simplify your entire experience. You can have confidence in your retirement with clarity from Jackson. Seek the clarity you deserve at Jackson.com. Jackson is short for Jackson Financial Incorporated, Jackson National Life Insurance Company, Lansing, Michigan, and Jackson National Life Insurance Company of New York, Purchase, New York. We are joined now by Dr. Emily Kuchel. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So, you know, when we talk about women and we talk about finance, for a lot of people, at least my friend group, I know there's an intimidation. So I'm always curious what brought you to this field and kind of your background and, and where that interest was sparked. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I actually started really in traditional finance and found that that was not a good fit for myself in terms of uh, selecting my major kind of early on. And I was uh, fortunate enough to have a, a counselor of sorts at the time who said, oh, you know what I think is probably best for you because you seem to enjoy working with people, you want to speak with people, is this thing called personal financial planning, which was brand new to me, had never heard of such a thing. And I got there. And what was amazing was to have professors who were also women who were actually leading um, that department and started to kind of show uh, that this really was an area for, for females. And so that allowed me to have, you know, representation in a lot of ways to show that female could be in this profession. And I continue on that journey um, to graduate school where I pursue master's and a PhD. And I actually have one female in particular that I continue to be and work with as a mentor and now as a colleague. And she was the first person in my life to say, I think you can go to graduate school. I think you have what it takes. I had never heard or considered such a thing until um, my professor, she said, you can actually do this. So that's kind of the early uh, steps into it was having somebody who said, you can. And somebody mm -hmm. who also introduced me to a field that seemed really hidden at the time, and in some ways still kind of is because we, we think of it very traditionally um, in terms of a finance, but personal finance being so a relatively new profession. And so it was these interactions with people that led me in that direction. Well, I'm glad you brought up the fact that, you know, being around other women um, and how they mentored you made a difference because I know women in several professions who um, always feel frustrated that they're the only ones, right, in school. They had to kind of, you know, blaze the path on their own. And even if you are listening and you were one of those women, I mean, just see the influence that you have made and other women who are watching you, right? So I, I think that it's very important for women, even if they get discouraged, to understand that you are making a difference to somebody. In your case, it was somebody that directly said, hey, Emily, you need to go to graduate school. But even if it was somebody who was going to graduate school and you saw it and thought, oh, well, you know what, that's a good idea. So I just think it's really important um, point to, to, you know, I'm glad you shared that. Um, because I think that it's, you, when you are represented, when you're seen, it does make it easier to follow that path, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Because everywhere else that you look, so, right, like I, I had this wonderful opportunity where I had a female and a female leader who was very confident in herself and instilled that confidence in me. But as soon as you went to those financial planning conferences, you were quickly reminded <laughs> that this is very much a male dominated space. And in uh, the interviews that were conducted for my first position, it was all men and it was trying to keep pace with the way that they were presenting um, the questions and the way that they were presenting themselves in the meeting. And it's funny, we kind of broached this topic. I was speaking with somebody recently about going to a conference. And I was like, you know, when I was younger, I put so much thought into, can I wear this professional skirt or dress? Can mm. I tie my hair back if I wear glasses or I don't wear glasses? And I was so very concerned about my appearance because I wanted to show that I could stand amongst the men 
in the room at those conferences because that's who was going to be my employer. And I, I still have that awareness to a certain extent, of course, just being professionally dressed, but it was different. The way that I was thinking about it and the reason I was thinking about it was very much different. It was to be amongst men as I entered the room and show that I could, you know, I could stand there. Isn't that so funny? Because that's something that men don't think about when they're walking in the room. They're not, they're not thinking about, uh, am I going to be seen as professional unless maybe it's like the cut of my suit or you know the brand of my suit but it's not the clothes the general clothes and hair in particular so you know that's one of the reasons we do this podcast is because we want to you know share that there are different mindsets when it comes to this and the success of women is very important in this field um and you know you talk about how this is a relationship with clients this is something you didn't know about and now you're in it how important do you think it is that you're being a woman in relationship with these clients? Is that Do you think that makes a difference? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we see in terms of just looking at research is there's a fair amount of research that supports that, especially when we're looking at career and, and just general vocation, that women typically want to work with people and that men want to work with things. And so finding the opportunity, especially in something that from kind of a, an outward appearance looks very math intensive, looks very isolating, looks like I could just be selling products and it's very transactional. Looking at the evolution of where financial planning is today, it really allows us to be very personalized in this space and have a real relationship and it's encouraged to create depth to that relationship. One of the things that we know is that women tend to generally be more empathetic naturally. And we see this across demographics. We see this across the uh, various countries. So it's not just isolated to the United States or to a particular demographic or socialization. We see that they inherently kind of have this ability. And so being a woman, knowing that money is arguably one of the most sensitive and kind of vulnerable topics that people discuss and, and don't want to discuss, having somebody who can be naturally empathetic or it's it's perhaps less challenging to have that connection and knowing that I really need to understand you as a person to make the best financial uh, plan for you or we can make, you know, really personalized financial planning approach. That's incredibly important. And um, I'll give just kind of a quick story sure. of this coming to light. So I was working for a financial planner is one of my my first jobs out of graduate school. And we're having a discussion and the client is a female. She begins crying because she has inherited money. The inherited money comes from the death of somebody in her family that she was particularly close to. The financial advisor is a male and he gets very uncomfortable with the fact that she's expressing emotion and of course is crying. Mm-hmm. And so he hands her some tissues and then says, So what the statements are showing is if we invest in X, Y, and Z, here's what's going to happen. It Mm -hmm. didn't take a moment to acknowledge the emotion, to understand that there's a deeper connection to this money and there's a real opportunity to connect with her as a client. I felt like that was bursting through my chest and he, for all intents and purposes, didn't have the training, the tools, the awareness, whatever it it was. But in that moment, you realize, oh, this is where you should take a pause. And it felt very much like a different approach had I been the one in kind of the, the lead position of that conversation. You know, that makes total sense. And again, you know, anytime that we have these conversations, you know, I, I never come at it from a, you know, male versus female in a competition sort of way. It's or, more of men have a certain skill set they bring and women have a, the skill set they bring. Uh, and each is equally important. It's funny you you say that I have a nine year old son. And just quickly, I had a conversation with him the other night because I was watching something and cried. But it was like, you know, a girl, we cry. And so we're right. used, women are used to emotions because it's tr- channeling through us all the time. And um, and so he was like, OK, mom, is this a sad cry or a happy cry or what kind right. of cry? And so I tried to explain to him, look, you know, women um, it's how we process. And so it's not so dramatic to us, but in, you know, in your story, it's very dramatic for a, a man who's not used to that <laughs> to not know what to do with that and be ma- made very uncomfortable. And so 
you know, the the result could have been for some people to see that response as harsh, as thoughtless, as heartless, and could potentially, uh, you know, risk losing that client, right? And so uh, I, I think that that is a, a very educational thing for everybody, because even some women sometimes uh, might come across as a little harsh. But um, do you think when you, when women see you, um, that they may be more comfortable to have those conversations and even be more engaged in their money management than maybe they would with somebody else? I think so, because to your point, there is a socialization to being a female where in a lot of ways we're expected to be more emotional. And so being in a room with a female financial advisor, a female financial planner, I assume that perhaps maybe she understands that feeling of emotion better than um, a male who may have been socialized to suppress that or that's not okay or emotions are not a part of business. And so perhaps just off of the way that we associate women and emotion, feeling more kind of like this is an acceptable or safe space to do that. I also think that perhaps we're more expressive about saying this is a safe space to do that. This, that's okay. We normalize the fact that there is emotion attached to this and there's an incredible amount of vulnerability attached to it. And um, even in the way that females are socialized and the way that we learn about money as young children looks very different. So mm -hmm. in our adult lives, we show up differently in money conversations. Um, so kind of just to, to tap into that for a second, generally what we see for uh, little boys is they are taught um, about being providers, they are taught about wealth accumulation, they're taught about good money management and savings behaviors, because that's going to result in, in this ultimate success. Whereas uh, little girls are generally taught about, um, yes, maybe saving, but also they're not being put on that kind of same pressure of like, you're going to be the provider, you're going to be the one who needs to know this stuff, you're almost trained in a certain way to say, well, somebody else will come along the way. This isn't necessarily your responsibility to do that. So when women show up in financial conversations, based off of that social legislation kind of at large, and just our general lack of financial education in our school systems, we can show up and feel very intimidated and overwhelmed. And having another female in the room who perhaps has had a similar experience means she probably gets it. So I can be a little bit more relaxed or I can show what feels like my incompetence, which it is not, but mm -hmm. I can show, I can show that inside of this relationship where um, perhaps meeting with men, again, similar to what I was doing, going to the conferences was I'm going to show up and show that I'm a very strong female and I'm going to act similar to the man or the men inside of the room. Well, and, and that's where, you know, we're in a transition period, I think, when it comes to, like you mentioned, with women and money and feeling more comfortable and understanding, wait a second, I can provide for myself. I don't have to have somebody else provide for me. And it also, to me, takes the pressure off the men to not, you know, you're not yes. responsible for everything and you shouldn't be yes. responsible for everything. Um, but it, you know, it is a transition because I still know peers who, similarly with money, it's a very they don't know what to do. And if they don't know what to do, then they don't do anything. And, um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons that I've tried to educate my son on the fact that emotions with women is not a bad thing. So like you mentioned, you go into the room with these men and for some reason, a more masculine, uh, uh, approach to things is the accepted approach. Does it, you know, and, and I always thought, do we, have we ever analyzed whether that is truly the best approach um, but it seems to be the accepted approach that is more masculine than feminine. And I think that men are, um, are not taught well when it comes to the fact that emotions are not a bad thing. And, and we're getting to that point, I think. And the reason I bring that up is because emotions and money seem to be wrapped together. Like your identity is wrapped around your income, your profession. Um, so, you know, is it a case where people do that too much? Or is it appropriate to say, look, your your whole being really does revolve around your money? What's interesting about our identity and our, our relationship with money is that all started to form far earlier than we ever knew anything about what money 
was. So for instance, in terms of um, being a young child, if you were around um, money conversations, you probably didn't understand exactly what was being discussed, but what you did to your point is you felt those emotions. So if money was being discussed and then money meant that the people in the room began to argue, I felt sad, I felt scared, I felt anxious, that emotion attached to my relationship with money. Or conversely, if money discussions meant we're going shopping and we're going on a trip and it's always very exciting and I'm very happy, I have a different emotional reaction to that. So that's starting before we ever know what money is. And what happens is kind of this evolution is we are challenged about our money beliefs and behaviors along the way. So one of those being, for instance, when you've started your first job or you're going to um, a university, whatever that experience is, now all of a sudden I've got exposure to a whole lot of other people and their money experiences and their values and behaviors around money. And what you'll notice is if, we're all guilty of this, having somebody in your life who's spending money and you go, oh my gosh, I would never do that. In fact, it's really upsetting that they would spend money in that way. Mm -hmm. Or we're like, oh, that makes sense. I would, I would absolutely do that exact same thing. So this emotional and relationship connection with money starts really early and it continues to show up in our adulthood until we really define or understand what that relationship is. And we have the ability to change it. If we don't like the way that we are attached to money or that identity around money, we have the ability to change it. But it is taking a little bit of time to understand where did this come from and, and why did this happen? Um, so I'll give you just for those listening kind of one prompt that we've used in research before and we use it oftentimes in um, conversation is I, I ask you to think about your first memory of money or your earliest, most impactful memory of money. Most of the time when people take a moment to do that, they can attach it to, I was rewarded with money for doing a task or it came in this way or I was saving it for something that was really special to me. And what you can do is through that exploration, you can start to see where some of these early identities and values actually came from. And then people will say, but I, I hated that. I never wanted that to happen again. Or I like that about myself and I continue to do that behavior today. And it, it opens up kind of this whole journey and exploration that we can go on. I love that because I, as you're speaking, my parents um, were uh, depression kids. So it was, you know, squeeze something out of a nickel, right? They were those kind of parents. And so I've had to learn to not feel guilt for big ticket items where I have a sister who fills the soap bottle with water to make it last longer, right? <laughs> So, I, and I, and I criticize her for it, but you know, anyway, uh, but we, but that's where we came from. And so as you speak, it's like, it's good to know that. And that's why I think it's important to work with a financial advisor, correct? To where someone can, it's almost like a psychology uh, session as well as a financial one. So, uh, you know, as we close up, is there something, if it's a financial advisor that's listening, do you have advice on how they can better their relationship with clients and then the second part of that is if it's a client who is listening, what advice do you give to them? Yeah, so for an advisor, this this can feel a little heady. It can feel like I am not your therapist. I was not trained to be your therapist. However, we do see this evolution of advice coming into play. And the field is changing from being very transactional, product-driven to being more holistic and collaborative. Um, if you're looking for something that's a little bit closer to the bottom line and the connection, if you think about it, the amount of information we have available today is overwhelming. So the table stakes when it comes to a financial planning and financial advisor relationship is I believe that you're going to deliver a financial plan, right? I, I expect that. What's different is the differentiator here is the quality of that relationship, the depth of that relationship that you can provide me, and the fact that I feel that it's really personalized to my unique circumstances, because there's, again, everybody's relationship with money, we go back to that example, it is very unique to them. That's the differentiator. If you can go beyond the plan and beyond the numbers, we see that in terms of not only greater satisfaction or 
reduction in financial anxiety, but also in greater loyalty and retention. And that directly hits your bottom line. So if we're looking to like take this from what feels abstract to directly into the books, there's great satisfaction to be there. And, and all planners for the most part want to make people better people. And that comes from helping them with their finances. But if that's a little again, too abstract, it does tie closely to the bottom line. And there, there is a differentiator here to tap into. For clients that are listening and for those that are kind of hearing about this for the first time or exploring this or seeking financial advice, if this is something that's important to you, I encourage you to find a financial advisor, a financial professional that does give you this safety for the vulnerability to explore this, that embraces this personalization and, and creates that depth in the relationship. And don't be afraid to ask them about their services and what they're going to provide and what makes them different. So telling the advisors, hey, this is a differentiator. As a client seeking a financial professional, see if that differentiator is something that you really care about. And if not, it's, it's like when you go to seek a mental health professional or a therapist, it's okay to say no, just because you had the first conversation with them doesn't mean you have to stick with them forever. So give yourself permission to explore, to have those conversations and say, this is right for me, or this isn't right for me. And I encourage you to continue going until you find the best fit. I love it. Dr. Emily Kuchel, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And if somebody wanted to reach out to you, how would they best do so? Absolutely. Um, easiest way, of course, is going to be on LinkedIn, but always happy to respond to an email. So first initial and last name at emoneyadvisor.com. Love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Invest in Women, the podcast series. Your insight into the growing wealth of women and how to attract and retain your female clients and help scale your practice. Learn more by subscribing to this podcast or visiting fa-mag.com.